Andrew Shore on location in sunny San Diego, outside the San Diego Convention Center. There are thousands of doctors from around the world gathered here to discuss blood-related disorders, including Hodgkin lymphoma, which typically affects younger people. One expert who's here and presenting data at this meeting is Dr. Ajay Gopal from the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. He told us about his data and also about the disease. It's a very hopeful story. Dr. Gopal, there are many types of lymphoma. Help us understand how what we would call Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin's lymphoma, I think now Hodgkin lymphoma. Explain where that fits in. Hodgkin lymphoma uh, has uh, been one of the success stories in hematology and oncology. Uh, unlike other lymphomas, it tends to affect young people. And historically, this was a, a death sentence. This was a disease where young people uniformly died of their cancer. Uh, but it's been a huge success story in that now a majority of people can be cured. We can cure people up front with combination chemotherapy. And for those that relapse, we still have a second chance of curing about half with a stem cell transplant. So from the beginning, from the time of diagnosis, uh, in some series up to 90% of people can be cured of their Hodgkin lymphoma. However, for those that aren't, this is a very difficult situation. When a young person is suffering from Hodgkin lymphoma, how does it show up? You know, they could be tired, they could be working out too much. How does it present itself? Uh, many Hodgkin lymphoma patients, because they're young, because young people, and, and I think all of us to some degree, don't want to believe we can get sick, um, things can progress to a fairly advanced state before they recognize that something's not right. Most commonly people will present with palpable lymph nodes, lumps they can feel in their neck, armpits, groin, uh, or fatigue. Sometimes people get night sweats, sometimes people can get diffuse itching. Uh, there are a variety of presentations, but many times people do shrug it off uh, to being something else, uh, and it takes some time to make the diagnosis. How do you know what you're dealing with? Is it a biopsy? That's critical, to have a proper excisional biopsy of the lymph node to make the diagnosis. Hodgkin lymphoma does take a fair bit of tissue to make the diagnosis because the actual malignant cells are rare uh, within the lymph node. If someone is diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, how important is it to see a specialist such as yourself? Typically, I mean, I, there are fairly straightforward algorithms for most patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and um, most patients with Hodgkin lymphoma are treated in the community. Uh, we have large studies suggesting what the optimal therapy uh, should be. Um, but it never hurts to get, make sure one's on the right track, particularly in a disease where we should be able to cure the, most, the vast majority of people. You don't want to lose the opportunity for upfront cure. So an individual cancer can vary. How do you know what you're dealing with? Maybe how aggressive one person's Hodgkin lymphoma is. So there are ways we can guide both our, the prognosis, give the prognosis, uh, as well as guide our therapy. So the simple is to look at the stage of the disease. How many locations uh, is the disease uh, located in? Uh, also, there are other factors um, such as serum albumin, white blood cell count, various laboratory tests, uh, as well as the age of the patient, as even gender does play a role in terms of likelihood of being cured. Nevertheless, we typically guide our therapy based on the stage of the Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as a few other uh, potential adverse factors to try to not overtreat some patients who can be cured with less intensive therapy and not undertreat other patients who would likely require more aggressive therapy to give them the best chance of cure. So how does the process begin? When someone is diagnosed, where do you start? So typically we will obviously meet the patient, take a history, find out what's going on, examine the uh, patient. Uh, we would want to do something we call staging the lymphoma, uh, which involves a CT scan uh, and a PET CT scan. Uh, oftentimes we'll do a bone marrow biopsy. It somewhat depends on the results of the imaging. Um, and then blood work, and blood work can also be prognostic in terms of whether somebody has higher risk disease or lower risk disease and potentially help guide our therapy. So we put all that information together, then we sit down with the patient and the family and say, here's our recommended plan to give you the best chance of cure and strike the right balance between not over-treating and not under-treating. So help me understand course of therapy, beginning chemotherapy, 
Is that where you start? It varies. Uh, there, will, there would either be a shorter course of chemotherapy plus radiation or a longer course of chemotherapy without radiation is sort of the typical uh, standard. So if that run of chemotherapy is successful, is that it? Do you just follow them for some period of time? Or? Typically we follow patients for about five years. Uh, the further one gets away from the primary therapy, the higher the chance of being cured. Uh, and for patients who have low risk disease, early stage disease, we can say with quite a bit of confidence that we should be able to cure them. Um, but we do typically follow patients for about five years in our oncology clinic, uh, and then we will pass the baton over to our survivorship clinic. Now, is a young person who's been treated with these powerful drugs, are they at risk of a second cancer? That's an excellent point. And what we, are, what we are trying to do, obviously, with the not over-treating patients is to not subject patients to unnecessary long-term risk. But yes, you're exactly correct. There, there are higher risks of secondary cancers, other complications such as low thyroid function if they had radiation over the chest or neck, um, potential cardiac uh, toxicity uh, for the long term. So it's really beyond a survivorship clinic. It's really something that primary care providers need to be informed about uh, when they have these patients who were 10, 20, 30, 40 years out of curative therapy. And patients themselves need to be uh, educated as to how to inform their providers and what to be aware of. Dr. Gopal, let's go on to the people who unfortunately don't respond to that initial therapy. What do you have for them? Well, for those who we don't get into a complete remission, PET scan negative, really we need to achieve a complete remission to have a chance of cure. Um, or for those who got a complete remission and had the cancer come back, our second shot of cure is to do something called an autologous stem cell transplant. So typically we would often do another biopsy to confirm that uh, this is a, indeed what's coming back, the same process. And then we would give them more chemotherapy followed by collecting stem cells, and then high-dose therapy and reinfusion of the stem cells, autologous stem cell transplant. And in that situation, we can cure about half of the patients who are transplanted. What about the patients who don't respond to the stem cell therapy or relapse? We have some new strategies, and uh, I, there's a long potential list that I could go through, but I, to highlight what you're bringing up here, my colleague uh, Rob Chen from the City of Hope uh, has put together data along with data from our cancer center looking at the ability of a new drug called Brentuximab vidotin, uh, also called Etcetris, uh, which is a targeted uh, antibody drug conjugate. It's a way of delivering, delivering targeted chemotherapy specifically to the tumor cell. Uh, previous data that has been uh, presented uh, has shown that in, after, in Hodgkin lymphoma that comes back after autologous transplant, about three quarters of patients can achieve a response. But response is not good enough. Uh, the idea is to cure patients. And we know that allogeneic transplant, getting a transplant from somebody else, has the potential to cure patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. The challenge with that is that patients need to be ideally in a complete remission going into that transplant, and that can be tough. That can be tough, one, because the lymphoma is very resistant to therapy at that point, and two, folks who have had lots of therapies are not able to tolerate very intensive chemotherapy um, after having had an autologous transplant. So Rob Chen uh, and I and colleagues are presenting uh, data uh, at this meeting showing that this drug Brentuximab vidotin or Etcetris can put patients into remission and allow us to move those individuals onto an allogeneic transplant. Given what you have today, is this all a very promising landscape for Hodgkin lymphoma? Well, that's what we hope. I mean, I think it's very early. The follow-up after transplant for the patients that, we're, that are going to be presented at this meeting is just one year. Um, gratifyingly, all of the patients are alive and 92% are alive without the Hodgkins coming back. But clearly one year is not enough and we're going to need longer follow-up to hopefully see that most of these patients can stay in remission. Dr. Gopal, we've mentioned this new drug, et cetera. How does that work, different from what you've had before? The main difference is that it's targeted. It binds a protein on Hodgkin lymphoma cells called CD30. And when this antibody, the specific protein that binds CD30, 
binds the target. It's then taken into the tumor cell and releases a chemotherapy that's attached to, to the antibody. So it's a targeted way of delivering chemotherapy. So what it appears to do is deliver very high levels of chemotherapy within the target cell and relatively spare the rest of the body, thus allowing high efficacy with relatively less uh, side effects. Dr. Gopal, whether it's for the patient themselves, usually a young person, or their parents or friends, what would you say to them today to give them hope? What I would say up front is that we still can confidently say that the majority of individuals with Hodgkin lymphoma we should be able to cure right off the bat. With the first therapy, the first regimen we give, most will be cured. So that's, I think, a huge amount of hope, which we can't say about a lot of advanced cancers. Uh, so that, that's, that's the biggest statement, is that we can cure most people up front. For those that we can't, we have strategies to cure, have a second clearly proven shot of curing people with an autologous stem cell transplant. And then for the small group of individuals who have the lymphoma come back after autologous transplant, there are many new therapies. Uh, Brentuximab vedotin is one. There are other approaches that we're investigating and we are always thinking, always trying to push the envelope for new options for these young people who suffer with Hodgkin lymphoma. Thankfully, now with the data presented here and a broader range of treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma, young people affected by the condition can look forward to the prospect of a long and healthy life. On location in San Diego, I'm Andrew Shore.